Welcome to the Future of Sharing, the series where we're looking deeply at how do we make the sharing economy work for everyone. I'm Pete Leiden, I'm the founder of reInvent, and today we've got John De La Volpe, who is the Director of Polling at the Institute of Politics at Harvard. He's also the founder and CEO of Social Sphere, essentially a public opinion firm that actually uh, really taps into social media and understanding metrics like that. Uh, the main thing we're really interested in, though, to have John here is that he is a bona fide expert on the millennial generation, and he, twice a year at least, uh, they do deep, deep surveys into understanding what the millennial generation and other young people are actually thinking about politics, pu public policy, and public service. Great to have you here, John. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. Yeah, it's nice to have you here. So why don't you... Uh, Give a little context of what I just introduced there. You're, you're, what are you doing to tap into the brains of kind of millennials? Millennials uh, really are driving a lot of this sharing economy, and so we're really extremely interested in getting any kind of insights on that. But uh, yeah, you know, what's um, the survey? Tell, talk us about how you do it. Sure. Um, what's re most remarkable about this project is it was never my idea. You know, back in 2000, it was the idea of two 19-year-olds at Harvard, hmm. you know, um, who 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 realized that very few members of their generation were interested in voting in their first significant election, you know, of their lifetime, you know, as voters in 2000. Um, but it seemed like everyone on this campus, on campuses and high schools across America were concerned about volunteering, you know. So the idea for the survey was to see if we could understand this disconnect between volunteerism in political activity through voting. That was the idea of the survey. These two 19-year-olds who, who are in the mid-30s, who I'm still very friendly with, Trevor and Aaron, they came to the Institute of Politics. And they said, let's do a survey. Let's see this. Let's see if we can understand this disconnect. Don't young people understand that if they volunteer and vote, they can change America much, much faster? So that was the beginning um, of our project. Um, the, the goal was to do one survey back in the uh, spring of, of 2000. We worked with a couple of dozen students, undergrads at Harvard. I essentially had to listen to the questions that they were interested in learning uh, about. Um, I helped them feel this first survey and then um, we've been doing it we've been doing it ever ever since. So the beginning of this, as I said, was really to understand the, the disconnect between volunteerism and voting and um, we've you know we've come a long way we've come a long way since that. Okay, so let's step back, given we have a, a time here to really understand this, and because um, a lot of people have kind of a pop understanding of demographics and, and, and uh, the millennials. So when you're talking, how do you define the millennial generation right now? What's the age brackets and why, why do you define the endpoints? There's always this yeah. discussion on that. So uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it's always important to say, I, can, I think we have two halves of this generation. But generally speaking, you know, I consider millennials, there's no perfect answer, but young people born between 1980 in 2000, right? So essentially people who are, you know, 16 or 17 years old all, all the way up into the mid 30s, that is kind of my definition of millennials. Using that definition, we have the largest generation in the history of America, the largest generation in the history of the world. Um, it's about about 25%, slightly more millennials than baby boomers in America today. Um, the focus, we do a lot of research with young people, both at Harvard as well as, as, well as at Social Sphere. Um, it's important to note my work at Harvard isn't only focused on mill the millennial generation. Um, it's it's really focused on kind of young Americans. So young people be born young people between ages 18 and 29 is my focus at Harvard. Um, again, that is one part of our research. We're doing a lot of research, you know, for for other clients inside uh, the United States and, and around the world in this generation. Now, one thing you mentioned, you think of it as two different cohorts. Um, I also think when I think of the baby boom, I think of it as a similar thing. There's the front, I call them the front end boomers and the back end boomers. Is it a similar dynamic going on in the millennials? And explain that if that's true. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the most important things to understand about this generation. I think the kind of the, the older cohort, I mean, it's very similar to, I think, to baby boomers, but the older cohort of millennials, I think of them as coming of age around 9 11, okay? Um, they essentially think about they were in high school or maybe early college during 9 11 and um it, when, if you understand that you understand the fact that that's how they their first entry point into civic life into government etc so we had a a country and a generation rally around the flag 
in, uh, in 2001, 2002 for obvious reasons. But then they saw a, an administration in Washington, D.C. that they essentially began to disagree with pretty strongly around the, the, the prosecution of that war um, and, and global war on terror. Um, they also saw a response to Katrina, for example, during the, those early days, and they began to distrust governments. Um, that's important because that uh, combination of political views with the rise of social media, with the, uh, imp of the important work that a lot of um, um, NGOs were doing to help mobilize young people on campuses, et cetera, actually could have uh, laid the foundation for the movement that became you know, Barack Obama's campaign in 2008. You know, that campaign was fueled by the first half of this generation. Okay. The second half of this generation, however, came of age after that, came of age at the time of the Great Recession, so parents, neighbors, friends, and other family members, you know, really had their life turned upside down. Um, and they have a very different view, I think, or somewhat different view of the way in which they think about the economy, government, politics, et cetera. So two different, largest generation ever. One part came of age during um, the time of uh, anti uh, kind of Bush uh, administration's views towards what towards towards the war culminated with uh, the election of Obama. And then the second group came of age essentially during the Great Recession. So now when you again, people that don't really understand generational anything or generational politics, um, is it safe to say so every generation kind of has a personality at some level, partly shaped by how they came of age. How do you, when you think of the big kind of ways to understand the millennials as distinct from the boomers, let's say, or even Gen X, um, what, what are your kind of working kind of levers that you start to play with there? Yeah, I, I think the, the most important thing to understand about millennials is, although they don't, again, I, I come out of it largely from like the, um, the kind of the citizen consumer, point of view, right, in terms of how they think about um, their community, their country, and the world. That's that's kind of where I start in terms of trying to understand those values. And um, the most important thing <clears throat> I can I can share about this generation is that while some people may think of them as apathetic, they don't vote to the extent that we would like them to vote, it doesn't mean they don't care deeply about their community and their country. You know, um, I think kind of the overriding characteristic of this generation is is to the extent to which they volunteer to make things better is is very difficult if not impossible okay for me to have a a conversation a qualitative session a focus group or some random group of young people um in america without having most members of this group tell me they're volunteering in some way to make the community better it doesn't matter if i'm talking to ivy league students or if I'm talking to community college students or members, you know, of um, of different groups across the country, in their DNA, I think there's a sense of volunteerism and service and making the things around them better. Um, in fact, it's so prominent. I think in this generation, it's almost it's almost difficult for me to measure it because people don't even think of it as volunteerism. They think of it as just what they do every single day. Hmm. Um, and I think that's kind of a special thing. Um, that um, is uh, significant about this generation. It, it, it keeps me very, very optimistic about the future of America because this, uh, this need to make their, their surroundings better exists um, and it's, they're essentially ready to be kind of uh, empowered, I think, from uh, companies, institutions, brands, government leaders, et cetera, to get even more out of it. Mm. Fascinating. Any other big kind of meta ways you think about that before we get into some some, some specific specifics? Yeah. You know, so I think I think that's one. I think um, I think their definition of the American dream is changing, evolving, and, and and different than other generations. I think which kind of taps squarely into the conversation we can have about the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think their definition of success is very much kind of impacted um, by the way in which they've grown up. Um, for example, um, young people, and again, we see this from, from survey research work and from qualitative work as well, um, they are far less interested in, um, in only kind of, um, you know, uh, making money or how much they, or they're paid for something, and they value flexibility, you know, much more. Um, young people, um, I think, have a relatively modest view 
of uh, what it means to be successful from a financial point of view. They actually have kind of a longer view in terms of finances are important, um, of course, but they also see real value in, in maintaining some kind of flexibility to travel, to kind of connect with friends and family, and to kind of pursue the interests um, that are important to them. So that's a, a second, I think, element that um, is, is probably a little bit more unique about this generation as compared to my generation, generation X. And I think, you know, the third way um, that uh, I think about this generation that may be different, certainly different than older generations, is a relationship with the rest of the world. Young, young people um, see much, are interested in a far more kind of collaborative spirit around solving challenging problems, you know, whether they're in the classroom or on the world stage. They see kind of, um, they see non-governmental uh, actors. They see, um, they see international organizations as playing kind of a primary role in solving problems and challenges as compared to the U.S. alone, right? So they're collaborative. They have a definition of, different definition of success, and they want to roll up their sleeves and make their, their community and their country better. Okay, so again, before we get into the uh, more of the specific to the sharing economy, the obvious thing people go to is politics, and you're coming from your institute uh, of politics. Um, how do they map in, po in, the, in the political world in, in any kind of uh, nuance the way you kind of look at it as opposed to how well, people think about it? And one thing I will say is, because uh, I've done enough kind of generational uh, work in my past, is that some people just think, oh, when you're young, you're, you're kind of liberal, and when you get older, you get more conservative. And that, that's clearly not the case generally. But we talk about how do their politics fit in America right now um, with the idea of helping people understand um, uh, where they're coming from. So um, it has changed. So I, I, it, that's, it's a complicated question. And my answer today is different than if you asked me a year ago or 18 months ago, right? Um, so um, to, to give you some um, context for how young people fit um, uh, in, in politics today, you know, we, according to the exit polls, you know, the most recent election, 55% of 18 to 29 year olds voted for Hillary Clinton, voted for the Democrat. Um, 18 months ago, when I did my first survey of this cycle, um, I asked young people, you know, if the election were today, we didn't know who the candidates were gonna be, do you prefer the generic Democrat or the generic Republican to control the White House? Okay, fifty-five percent said they prefer the Democrat. What eighteen you, months ago? You said sixty-five or fifty-five? Sorry, that's fifty-five uh, percent. So it's the 55%. same. So it's the same fifty-five, basically. So it's the same fifty-five percent. Okay. Okay. So um, so that Hillary Clinton and that campaign essentially kind of did not grow. You know, um, uh, their kind of percentage or share of that youth vote really over the last 18 months, okay? What I have been saying for a couple of years now is that for a Democrat to win a national uh, campaign and also, you know, a campaign for the Electoral College, he or she needs to win 60% of this generation, okay? Barack Obama won 66% back in 2008. Uh, Barack Obama against uh, Mitt Romney won 60% in 2012. Hillary Clinton won about 55 percent. The exit polls are not perfect, but most indications are that she won, um, you know, she won, you know, uh, that that uh, segment, but not by the margin that was necessary, okay, for her to carry Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and some of those other places, okay? They, they actually are more progressive and more liberal than they were a couple of years ago on some key issues. We can talk about that but they are not as connected to the Democratic Party um, as many people expected them to be, you know? So, um, What's in it, fact, what? another interesting insight from this round of exit polls that we saw, you had the number of self-identified liberals increase, the number of self-identified Democrats decrease in this last election. So, again, it just kind of shows, I think, kind of the true independent spirit of, of this generation. Um, they are willing to do much more than we think. They need to be empowered by um, by the organizations and institutions that kind of govern us more generally. Well, let's let's go a little one more notch on that because you know they clearly were behind uh, a lot of that younger energy behind Bernie Sanders. Um, were they looking for more 
transformative solutions? What, 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 is there something in there that's, that's saying um, the Democrats were not transformative enough or bold enough or, or kind of thinking big enough or something? Or what, 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 what do you make of that? In terms of yeah, well, when you look at the, you know, when you look at the last year, we look at all the votes cast, you know, more young people under 30 voted for Bernie Sanders, I believe, than Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump combined, right? So clearly there was something very, very special about that kind of Sanders appeal. And our first poll at Harvard, he started with 1% of the vote, right? Um, and I believe he didn't just change a party, but he moved a generation a few notches further to the left. So that's pretty clear from a lot of our research, okay? Um, but um, here are three or four other kind of data points about this generation. And um, if you understand those data points, I think the rest of the, I, I think the, rest of the narrative kind of fits um, pretty neatly. For example, um, more than half of this generation believes that for them personally, the American dream is dead, okay? There was a young woman in a uh, town meeting that I hosted um, uh, almost a year ago about 14 months ago at Harvard, she was actually a student from a historically black college. She stood up and said, for me, the American dream is dead because I'm black and I live in America. I asked that exact same question. Race was a factor, but race was not the most significant factor in the analysis. It had much more to do with level of education, right? And those folks who had not, been, had not graduated or attended a four-year college were clearly far more pessimistic. So that's one thing. You know, um, Bernie Sanders really kind of began to kind of really understood that. That's one. Second thing, same number, about a half or so of this generation have um, little to no confidence in the American justice system to do the right thing without regards to race or ethnicity. Okay. Half don't believe the American dream. The uh, Another half, another half, right, don't believe in the American justice system. In addition to that, um, only 25% trust the federal government, 11% trust Congress, 9% trust the media, 9 or 10% trust Wall Street. Okay, so um, so when I give you those four or five, you know, stats, therefore, in my opinion, it's not surprising that Hillary Clinton, as a Democrat, although they mostly agree with her positions, okay, was someone that wasn't able, wasn't as attractive. As, as, as Sanders was certainly could have been the primary because she essentially represented most of those institutions that young people have significant problems with, right? So, um, um, so that's kind of just kind of where, where things sit. And, um, and essentially, um, I, and I think the most startling uh, response to a question I've asked in some time um, was, uh, was just six months ago when I, when I asked 3,000 young people in my Harvard survey, whether or not, a yes or no question, do you support capitalism? Yes or no? Okay. Um, and a majority said they did not support capitalism. 42% supported it. The rest did not support it. So, um, in fact, in fact, Pete, I thought that was a mistake. I actually... I actually, for the first time ever, I've been polling for many, many years. I actually found additional research money. I did another survey just to make sure that there wasn't some sort of anomaly with the data. I did another survey, not just of young people, but of all Americans, 18 plus, I saw the same results. In fact, in America, in the springtime, it wasn't until you got over the age of 50, we had net support for capitalism. Now, again, I think it has less to do with capitalism and more to do with the way in which capitalism is practiced today in America as you know, kind of through the eyes of consumer, you know, citizen consumers, um, you know, but, but, you know, those four or five factors, I think are incredibly important for anyone who wants to have a relationship with young people, parents, educators, government, brands, et cetera, just need to know where they're coming from, you know, um, but most importantly, you know, they tell us of this concern, they want to fix it. You know, they want to be empowered to do so. And, you know, and um, we're, we're, I'm hopeful, I'm still hopeful that uh, Democrats, Republicans, et cetera, you know, will kind of empower these uh, young people to put them to work to solve some of these some of these challenges. Okay, well, just to flip it around, just to understand the other side, what numbers or what kind of attitudes do they have towards Trump in a kind of conservative kind of version of the way forward? What, what, what do you make of that whole thing? Yeah, so um, while 55% supported 
supported uh, Hillary Clinton, according to those exit polls. 37 percent supported Trump, you know, with a significant number supporting the third party candidates. Um, you know, certainly kind of more support for third party candidates among young people than other generations. That's probably not um, a no, probably not a surprise. Um, the last survey that we conducted heading into the heading it was it was in October, a few weeks before the election. Um, you know, um, again, because Hillary Clinton didn't do as well as she should have, it doesn't necessarily mean that young people were were or are supportive of President like President Trump. Um, you know, his his favorable his unfavorable ratio is essentially a one to four one favorable to you know three or four unfavorable so certainly he has a, a kind of a lot of work to do to establish trust with this generation um i think there are areas you know within public policy um where where young people can kind of connect with republicans um and there are i think there are more where they can connect with democrats but the lesson is that this is a fiercely independent generation um just because uh, uh, young people tell us they're more liberal um, and the way they identify themselves, we can see it in some of the policy-related data, doesn't mean that they're going to vote for, for Democrats in the future. It um, doesn't mean that they won't vote for Republicans in the future. This is a generation, I think this is kind of very much up for grabs. One of the issues, one of the issues, um, I think, where is an opportunity for Republicans as an example, to kind of create a connection with this generation would be around education and choice, you know, uh, in school choice. And, and that's an issue where the, uh, this generation has a different view, I think, um, in some cases than their parents. They are more likely to be for school choice, which is a potential opening for a Republican administration to kind of, to kind of connect with them. Um, there are a lot of uh, pathways that are, uh, there are a lot of issues, I think, coming from Washington today on the Republican side that are concerning young people um, around immigration and other things for sure. But um, the, the message and the point is that this is a generation up for grabs. They want to be connected. And I think it's the responsibility of both parties to try to kind of activate them. A Republican will never need to win this generation to win the White House. They just need to lose it less badly to be successful. And frankly, that's what Trump did. You know, um, difference, I think, between President-elect Trump, President Trump and President-elect Clinton is just four or five points on that youth vote. It made all the difference. Well, do you think there was any attraction of this generation to Trump as uh, a guy who was trying to bring big change? I mean, I'm trying to get this thing of like, a lot of the pieces you're saying there m make it sound like they're fundamentally dissatisfied with the system, how it's working, and need really want to shake stuff up. Uh, do you think there's any element? Well, first of all, is that true, you think? And, 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 uh, and if so, do you think there was any attraction to, to Trump just because he was going to do something besides oh, the same old thing? I think there's like yes and no. So um, they certainly voted for change, right? Certainly over the course of 2016, right? Let's, let's, you know, we have to really look at Bernie Sanders, okay? So Democrat socialist, you know, he was about change, um, you know, certainly kind of changing kind of, um, kind of the culture of, of, of Wall Street and essentially the culture of you need to know someone to get ahead, okay? So um, macro level, um, the two most successful candidates um, among young people, uh, the most successful candidate among young people was Sanders, um, you know, really kind of around his message of change. Um, Trump was clearly about change and, you know, and drain, draining the swamp or, you know, whatever metaphor that he was using. Having said that, young people do believe, okay, there's a more active role for government, and that's important. Um, that I talked about how young people are concerned about the way in which capitalism is practiced today. Well, when I, when I, you know, drive a couple hundred miles, you know, to Western New York or to Pennsylvania, you know, to talk to young people um, about what that means, they tell me they want a more activist government in some way, with respects, right? They tell me that they, 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 uh, they, they sense, they, they see a need for kind of a Roosevelt solution. For example, someone like Teddy Roosevelt, okay, who could come in and break up the big banks, 
but also someone like Franklin Roosevelt who could provide a, a social infrastructure. So it's just not about breaking things up and change for change's sake. They have a pretty solid view, I think, of the role, the role that Washington and government should play to, you know, not necessarily to, to level the playing field, okay, but to basically, you know, um, help provide opportunity for those people who are willing to work and deserve it. So even though, I, so, so it's sounding like, just, just finish this up, it, it feels like the, the, the Democrats or the progressives are closer ultimately to, to a home for these folks than, than a kind of the Trumpian conservative tenant version. But, um, but, but the, the deal hasn't been sealed there. I mean, and it's, it, whatever comes out of this thing, it's, the next iteration is going to is potentially hold it. Because the other thing about it, given the size of this generation, in the next 10 years, um, I mean, they really are going to, I mean, I don't know, what, what was their percentage of this election and what do you expect in the next couple cycles there? There, um, that's a great question. It's a little bit of a debate. We won't know the exact precise numbers until the, uh, the, the census population study is released in the spring. But um, high teens, maybe 18 or 19 percent of all of votes cast. Um, some people, some people say that's um, that that exit polls actually over count or, or young people overrepresented, but somewhere between 15 and 20 percent or so um, of all votes cast wow. came from. 18 to 29 year olds. Okay, I, I'm not counting. Oh. That's the way the exit polls look at it. Okay, so you still have 30 to 36 year olds um, that they, they're just not really not counted in that way in most of the exit poll results. But um, so they clearly, you know, probably 50 percent or less than 50 percent of folks in their 20s voted. Okay, and essentially every decade, you know, you can add, roughly speaking, and add another 10 percent. OK, so if around 50 percent or less of 20 something year olds voted, OK, 60 percent of 30 somethings voted, 70 percent of 40 and 50 year olds voted. That's a, kind of a general frame of, uh, of looking at participation. But another way to look at it is because a generation is so large, OK, oftentimes in a, in a presidential election, you have more people under 30 vote than people over the age of 65. Right, just because of the sheer number, right, of, uh, of people in that generation. So um, now we can talk for for some time about the impact that you know that they've had going all the way back to 2008. You know, I feel pretty confident that Hillary Clinton, not Obama, would be president if not for millennials. You know, uh, you know, Obama did so much better with millennials and every other you know element. Um, of uh, every other age cohort in those early primaries, he was able to to win Iowa, basically on the backs of millennials alone. He won that Iowa vote 55 to 10, lost everybody over the age of 30. So um, well, you know, so if not for millennials, you know, America would be in a pretty different place. And um, and I think they have an opportunity to do even more again if they're kind of empowered. From the top down. Now, the final final word on this from the your your fall October survey, um, at least from what I see here, that Obama's approval rating was the highest in seven years, despite only fourteen percent believing the country is headed in the right direction. Is that is that true? For that, did you, is that does that sound right for you? Well, yeah, that's kind of the that's clearly kind of the disconnect. You know, we asked that question a, a different way, and. Um, and I, I talked about the lack of kind of faith in most of those institutions, but uh, Obama, both with this generation and with Americans kind of generally, he's essentially at his highest point of personal favorability or approval since 2009. Um, so um, with this generation and with Americans kind of generally, he will leave, he will leave the White House with an approval rating right around 60%, you know, um, which is is pretty extraordinary relative to where he was just uh, just a couple of years ago. Having said that, uh, unfortunately, even with millennials, one of the main predictors of whether somebody will approve or disapprove of Barack Obama is the color of their skin, right? So when you when you look at the crosstabs of that approval rating, you know, um, African young African Americans, which represent about fifteen percent of eighteen to twenty nine year olds. Have been pretty solid with an approval rating of right around 80%, give or take two or three points 
for eight years, okay? Hispanics, about 20% of this generation, um, they've had a significant, you know, uh, they're somewhere between 60, 65, sometimes as high as 70% approval. You know, young whites, essentially since the day he was elected or certainly after that first couple of months, their approval has been less than 50%. So um, it's not necessarily kind of the post-racial generation that a lot of people hope for. Um, and unfortunate, you can predict too much of, uh, of opinion today based upon the color of one's, of one's skin and the communities they grew up in, et cetera. But, they, but so 60%, you said that's the approval rating for the millennial generation. Not, not, that's not for, it was overall. Yeah, I, th I, think, over, um, I yeah. think as he, as he exits the White House, its approval with miles would be pretty close to 60%, okay. we'll see. Yeah. Clearly that's some way forward for them. Okay, so let's drive it now down to a different level of government, which is really where the sharing economy works often is cities. Yeah. Um, so uh, now millennials, I mean, because you know the data, you, you're tracking these folks. I mean, it, it, it seems like millennials are kind of heading to the herb, their city base, that they're, they're flocking back to the urban cores the way the, in exactly the opposite direction the boomers kind of fled it. Uh, um, so urban politics is now getting, would you say, is, it, is more influenced by the millennials than even national politics? Or, or talk to me about that urban phenomenon of millennials. Well, I, I, I think you're right. And I, and I think, you know, one of the reasons that young people are flocking to cities is they, they um, sense of community, right? So, um, mm -hmm. The, the, the sense of community is incredibly important. Again, it, it, it's, it's um, you know, uh, one of these misnomers is that they're kind of narcissistic or a apathetic. They want to be part of where the action is, right? They want to make their, their community, whatever that community is, a better place. So, um, so that's, kind of, that's kind of one aspect of it. I think some of the, some of the, um, the most exciting cities in, in America, frankly, kind of are led by millennial mayors. You know, what's happening in South Bend, Indiana is incredible, led by, frankly, um, one of my former students, somebody I'm very proud of, but uh, a young 30-something-year-old um, young mayor named Buda, Peter Buttigieg, um, who's doing a kind of incredible things to kind of connect the disparate factions of that community of South Bend to, together for everyone's benefit. Same thing happening here in Boston, where we are with a Gen X or a mayor. So, you know, the best cities, the best mayors are the ones who are empowering young people, right, to help solve some of these problems and some of these challenges themselves. It was just this past weekend, I was fortunate to be part of a, just a terrific event in Boston, which was organized by Millennials of Faith. We had 2,600 people of faith, Muslims, Jews, Christians, et cetera, come together on a Sunday night to talk about not our differences, but what brings this kind of city together in overwhelmingly, you know, 2,600 people, 2,000 of them were probably under 30 years old. Those are pretty special events. Um, these are the events, again, empowered by the mayors, okay, who can bring them together, but it's really kind of the millennials who, who are kind of taking charge of, of these things. You know, um, what, in, in some cases, it's even more sophisticated than that, where they're actually building apps, right, to kind of solve problems and to alert, you know, city and urban administrations to some of the challenges kind of in and around, the, in and around their city. So, yeah, cities are, um, I think, are kind of a, a very, very vibrant place because of um, uh, and thanks to millennials. Do you think that, because um, they're just starting to move at least the front cohort into families and stuff, right. do you think, I mean, there is, cities are conducive to young people, you know, singles a lot. Um, do you feel that they'll stay in that kind of urban space in a way, or is there any, any indications or any thoughts on, on the kind of, the, 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 their long-term wanting to be in, in densely populated places and communities and, and be, yeah. anything around that? I think, uh, it's a great question. I think they are, interested in that it's a question of whether or not the infrastructure is there to support that you know um in, in too many cities still i think there's not um the infrastructure on education um that is uh required to um for young for a young family right to sustain kind of uh, an affordable lifestyle and provide educational opportunities for their children um 
there are just too many there in, in some cases kind of the urban schools are kind of falling behind not clearly or not catching up with suburban schools which is kind of a, a factor in why a young family may have to kind of um, head out to the suburbs so i think the interest is staying it's a question of not whether the community writ large can you know can, can support that through education, whether it's you know K through 12 education or even kind of preschool education, um, we may be you know another generation behind. I think in some cities to make them as livable, certainly ones in the Northeast and the West Coast, as millennials would like them to be. Do you think now one of the things that again the the rough polling that we're tracking here in this uh, future sharing economy thing is they they tend to, to value. Sp- experiences over owning things. Um, right. Can you talk to us about that phenomenon and, and, and what, how you see that in the numbers or, or what you make of that whole thing? I think that's uh, one, I've asked, uh, I've asked a question uh, many, many, many times in many venues, essentially about what are you looking forward to in kind of the first step of your career? You know, so in the next seven years or so, what's success to you? There's a variety of different ways we can ask the question. Certainly, kind of uh, uh, you know, financial compensation is a is a is a, a major part, but it's really not even the top two or three. The idea of um, doing something that they can feel good about, doing something they can be proud of, is oftentimes the first or the second thing or attribute that young people are interested in in like the first part of their careers. Right, connected to that. I think is this kind of idea of flexibility of our of uh, becoming you know a remaining a uh, a vibrant member of the community, being connected with friends and family. That's the second thing, right? The ex- and that has a lot to do with kind of experience. You know, having having um, uh, the opportunity to be mentored. You know, and learning things. Those are those are three or so of the factors that actually rise above financial compensation as something that's important. To young people as they enter kind of the workforce, they were thinking about you know kind of life in their in their early mid to kind of to, to late twenties. So that's a that's an important part of kind of how they think about kind of uh, the choices they make, right? And um, and uh, and where they think about pursuing jobs and and housing and, and those sorts of factors. Do because when you stress this on, on the millennials, obviously you're, you're you're probing them. Do you ever see that in contrast to other generations? I mean, do you ever? I mean, do you know what the boomers were thinking back then, or the Gen Xers at that period, or something? Or yeah, um, mostly mostly anecdotal because my data set only starts with millennials back in back in back in two thousand. But I'm I'm pretty sure if somebody asked me that question, kind of my cohort back, you know, 20, 20 or so years ago that I, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, flexibility and doing something I can be proud of, you know, was necessarily one of the top attributes um, that somebody would need to kind of attract me to their company, right? It was really about, uh, it was so much more about success was focused on kind of financial contributions rather than kind of an overall kind of experience. Um, Again, and the ability to, you know, folks, you know, have a, I think that young people and millennials work real hard, you know, but um, they want to feel like they're valued. They want to feel like um, that uh, their opinions matter. They want to feel like they want to contribute, but they'll contribute over 24 hour a day. They may not contribute every minute from nine to five, but over the course of a 24 hour day, I think they'll find many opportunities to contribute at the office, outside of the workforce, workplace, um, et cetera, the kind of connected experience, you know, um, is, is, is an important part, I think, of who, who young people are and what motivates them um, and, what, um, and where the kind of their passions and their, and their, and their values lie. And uh, I think it's important that this isn't, you know, uh, the, 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 um, the, the attributes of a generation, I think, are connect uh, th- these are the things that connect young people, whether they live on the two East Coast or the West Coast, or they live in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, or Dallas, Texas, or in uh, some of the rural parts of America. Really, you know, young people want to be connected. They want to be flexible. They want to have an opportunity to do something they can feel proud of. That's interesting. So the flexibility piece, you know, because a lot of people when they look at the economy, uh, they think 
that that um, freelancing and flexibility and some of these attributes of, uh, associated with the sharing economy, you know, driving for Uber and various things, that this is what a bummer for those poor young people. But you, is it safe to say that uh, they're not just, that actually they see that as a good thing almost more than, oh, I have to kind of take a job, I don't get a full-time job, I have to take these other jobs. I mean, is that a well, total reframe you gotta be thinking about just from the point of view of um, understanding the, the, the desire for that flexibility, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think it can be. I think it, I think it can be. Um, and it can't be. It depends upon, you know, the individual. For example, um, an artist, okay, um, or somebody who wants to pursue something in a nonprofit sector or passionate about art, passionate about pursuing something that may not have kind of a lucrative salary attached to it, um, has that flexibility to be an Uber driver, right? That they might not have had a generation ago um, and that person may not have been able to pursue nonprofit work or healthcare work, advocacy work, or the arts because of that. On one hand, on one hand, right? On the on the other hand, um, you know there are millions of young people who who did um, everything that they were supposed to do, right? They worked as hard as they could in high school. They worked as hard as they could in college. Um, they probably have loans and it's difficult to find kind of any job, any job kind of in their field that they're, they're looking to pursue kind of in and around the hometown, right? And so for those people, they may not choose to be an Uber driver or barista or something like this. It may be something they, they have to do because they don't have the opportunities that they thought they would have, that, right? That were part of kind of the compact the American compact and the American dream. So um, it, it's a basically kind of either side, you know, two sides of, uh, of that coin. It's not because I think those people aren't willing to work hard, you know, it's that um, for, you know, any kind of number of reasons, there just aren't as many opportunities as they might've been in other places based upon where you live. And again, I think it's a point to stress. I think the, the goals are relatively modest you know, success in the American dream for someone in New Hampshire is to teach school in the town that they grew up in New Hampshire. It's pretty difficult to do with the, with the aging population there. They may have to move to Arizona to pursue their dream, right? It's not to, you know, to buy an expensive house and have a nice car. They just want to be a school teacher because they were inspired. And that's their definition of the American dream. Um, and for too many young people, that is difficult to do for a variety of different reasons. So. The sharing economy, um, the flexibility, um, the entrepreneurship, it can, it can kind of cut both ways based on what perspective you have. Hmm. Interesting. Um, one piece of the sharing economy, and again, just probing this as we kind of, kind of circle back towards this, um, sustainability. There, there is a sense of like, you know, implicit in the sharing economy is like, well, hey, why don't we share that same room? You know, why do we need 50 houses? Why don't we share, you know, five houses? Or, right. you know, do we ever all have to have a car and sit in our driveway 95% of the time and no one uses it? I mean, why don't we just take Ubers around and that's all good. Um, to what extent does, because you haven't really mentioned it, the kind of worry of our climate change or sustainability and that kind of stuff. How so the, the, the question of uh, climate, the question of sustainability is, is an important but a secondary concern for this generation. Oh, explain yeah. that. Explain uh, that. Because some okay. people think, oh, the, they're just so, that's their primary idea. But it, 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 in fact, you know, based on a lot of research I look at, certainly around social media analytics, you know, um, it's essentially kind of 40 year old women, independent minded women who are driving that issue in many, many cases, not saying it's not incredibly important issue. OK, it's a second. It's a important but secondary issue. OK, relative to the sustain the economic sustainability of a young person. OK, uh -huh. um, very, very important. Um, the idea of, of um, the idea of, uh, of, of having uh, a compassionate capitalism where you can work hard and try to get a job in the field that you're pursuing, those are the sustainability issues of this generation. 
And um, once those are taken care of, okay, um, this generation clearly is cognizant in, uh, of the environment and uh, it's very, very important. But I think you know, the financial sustainability is primary and there's a lot of research you know, we can talk about indicates that with environmental sustainability kind of second. Now, that could change, okay, based upon a new administration, okay, who, who, who's talking about kind of, you know, um, uh, rejecting, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the Paris Accords and, and, and some of these other accords. And this could become a primary issue, but essentially it's not a motive, it's not the primary motivator for political or economic actions as far as we can see. Secondary, not primary. I'm just curious, given that you just pointed out this 40-year-old, 40s era female driving it, what is that about? I mean, I'm just curious. I've never heard that kind of hit on Yeah, that. no, when I, we do a lot of analysis of, um, of this issue based upon people who are uh, creating content on social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And uh, on a per capita basis, you know, females in their 40s and 50s are far more likely to create content around uh, environmental causes than young people. <laughs> so a lot of the stimulus for this conversation is, is basically kind of coming from essentially kind of the moms, okay, of millennials, not just from millennials. Okay? <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that's, that's been, you know, the kind of the case in, in this recent election. It was not a primary kind of differentiator, even though Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton had very, very different views on climate change and the environment, you know, um, Hillary Clinton basically kind of underperformed or, you know, underperformed most Democrats, given the fact that she ran against someone who, by most measures, is kind of unclear whether or not, you know, uh, climate change is created by man or not at, at best. So if we're talking in a lot of this series is actually um, the audience is, you know, people running cities, people thinking about how the future cities, um, and given that these young people, these attitudes, you've, you've given us a very big picture, which is awesome, and driving it down through politics, national, and even into here. But would you say that um, the local politics that uh, young people would respond to, or younger people, and again, 35-year-old is not you know, that young. They're, they're family, having driving families and great jobs and the whole thing. Um, but do you think that, um, Attitudes towards the sharing economy, towards innovation, towards changing public policies, towards allowing new things, towards getting beyond incumbent industries. I mean, do you think these are kind of flashpoints at a local level that younger uh, people will help drive a change in those local policies? Or do you feel that they're just, uh, or, or, or possibly, or maybe not as engaged on that kind of stuff? I'm just curious where they would fit in. What is essentially getting to be on many you know, many cities right now are struggling around this issue of, of how do we adapt uh, local regulations for whether it's hotels or taxis or food, you know, sharing the sharing kind of touching food and they're, you know, sharing tools and they're sharing, you know, anyhow, all kinds of stuff. I'm just curious, any insights from your generational insight on how you'd understand that politics playing out or any guidance or any thoughts on, on how you, you might think about um, the next five to ten years as this evolves? Yeah, so... Um I think a couple. I think a, a, a couple of, uh, of points generally, and then some specifics. Okay, um, and whether it's politics or business, um, for a young person to invest time or resources, they need to like you, right? They need to like you. They need to respect you. So I just mentioned that climate sustainability is an important but a secondary factor, it doesn't mean that those companies where that is a core value shouldn't be communicating that to, to young people, to millennials. They absolutely should. But you know, number one is kind of economic sustainability, number one. But for anyone hoping to have a relationship with a millennial, they need to like you first, okay? So it has as much to do with the values um, and the quality of the product the experience, et cetera, as, as price, as almost anything else. So that's kind of number one. And, and if you can kind of create that rapport, create that relationship, um, 
then you can kind of tap into that later on, right? So whenever I talk to local or statewide or, 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 or kind of nationally kind of elected officials or government administrators or even brands, I think they all have an opportunity to, um, on a local basis, local by geography, local based on issue, local based on any other segment, is to identify the young people who are most passionate about that issue, right? Um, empower them. Let them know that we hear you, uh, that um, that you don't like this or you like that, okay? That their opinion matters, and then ask them to do something, okay? Mm -hmm. Let them know that's not sufficient for you to complain. It's not sufficient for you to um, boycott. It's not sufficient for you to challenge the system, okay? If we're collectively going to improve the situation, whatever this is, okay, um, things work better when millennials are kind of empowered and managements, you know, the establishment institutions can listen and kind of craft solutions kind of bottom, uh, top down and bottom up. That's when kind of the, the really kind of exciting things happen, whether it's on commerce, whether it's in the public space, et cetera. So there are dozens and dozens and dozens of applications around that. And the sharing economy is probably the primary example, you know, providing an infrastructure for young people to drive a car when they choose to, to provide an infrastructure for young people to travel um, when they choose to, you know, um, in terms of uh, with friends and, and finding rooms and, and, and apartments and those sorts of things. So that's a primary example of, of uh, institutions and corporations enabling and empowering young people to, to have, create their own experiences. Um, and those are a couple of good examples, you know, and I think I'm hopeful that we'll see dozens and dozens and dozens of more. Again, it just shows that young people are not apathetic. Give them the tools, give them some encouragement, maybe give them a title, you know, make them feel like they're a part of the solution and they'll do pretty, pretty incredible things. Um, and uh, that's probably easiest to do at the local level. Right at the local level and in, in, uh, in local governments. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're kind of coming to the end here of the of the conversation, but um, it's just been awesome. Um, but one one thought here is uh, there's another generation coming behind these folks, um, <laughs> and actually, according to your metrics, there they're just entering Harvard. There are different, you know, these schools. Is there any thoughts on? Um, that next generation and, and, and kind of, I mean, I don't know, what are people even calling them these days? Or what, how, how do people start wrapping their heads around that generation? Any, any thoughts just as you, because we got this cohort now that's starting to get clearer and clearer and moving into society, but w w what's the next, the next one up? You know, um, I think it's a little bit early to label them. And frankly, it's a little bit early. I'm not too comfortable talking about kind of what, um, any sort of insight that I might have um, about about this generation just coming of age? Because you're right, they're you know they're in their teens. I have three, you know, <laughs> I have three kids. Uh, two technically, I guess, are millennials. One's a little bit younger, you know. But the difference in and how they view things is is, is is pretty interesting. I mean, one my oldest remembers 9/11, first grade. You know, uh, we were in Boston. His first homework assignment. Was drawing a picture of the tragedy of that day. My youngest one um, was only two. She had no memory of that. So um, I tend to think that kind of uh, uh, national and global events drive um, uh, the relationship that young people have with their with their community. Um, the, the the level of trust or distrust in institutions is incredibly important. Um, we, as I said, that um, I think that's impacted the way in which millennials vote, buy things, work, et cetera. Um, and I think it's a little bit too early to see how the Trump administration, how uh, the rest of the events around the world kind of will shape the worldview of this generation kind of coming up, right? Um, clearly, um, the way in which they process information is going to be uh, different than older millennials. The idea of video versus text, I'm very concerned about, you know, the role that news has, you know, in a quote, post-factual society. So these are, these are uh, very kind of 
in, in, important kind of questions I don't have the answers to, but this is something that I'll begin, begin to take a look at actually as we speak. One of the things, um, and actually we have a, a research project that will be finished in the next couple of weeks, where we're, we're tracking how a 17-year-old or 18-year-old and a 27-year-old use their phone, right? We're tracking um, kind of the relationship they have with their phone, how they use it, what they use it for, those sorts of things. And uh, I think, you know, check in with us in a few months or a few years, we'll have a better indication. But I'm not too comfortable offering up some great insight <laughs> at this point. Not fair. Well, we'll see what great global <laughs> events will structure that generation. Uh, hopefully not too disastrous in the next uh, Let's hope. two to Let's four hope. years. <laughs> So anyhow, this has been a fascinating conversation, good hour of getting deep in the mind of one of the few people in this country that really is tapped into all these, this data, all these insights, and really the, the, the ideas of a fascinating and extremely important generation, one that's just really getting started as it rolls through American society, politics, the economy, one that we all need to tune into, particularly when it comes to thinking about the sharing economy and uh, how we rework cities in the next five to 10 years. Thanks. It's been great to have you. Thank you.